right, gentlemen, we are rolling. All right, William. First off, thank you so much for taking the time to. Uh, take your mask off too. Really. Okay. And sit straight up. Yeah, this is some chill time. First off, William, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to talk to us this morning. I know you're a busy guy. I, I want to start things off. How long have you lived and worked in the city of Shreveport? Uh, I will now have been here. Uh, I've now been here 16 months. 16 months. And where are you from originally? Uh, well, um, so my parents are from Shreveport. Okay. So when I was young, I came up and visited all my relatives uh, every, every summer. Uh, so I was very familiar with Shreveport, but I grew up in Texas and then I went to um, LSU because both my parents attended LSU. And I was the firstborn child of two LSU graduates, so they gave me a, a zero choice of where I was going to attend college. Okay. <laughs> so I was going to say, so how long, you know, did you work as a director of water and sewage before coming to Shreveport? Or? Yes, I was the director of public works in Baton Rouge, and then I was the chief administrative officer for the entire parish. Mm -hmm. Then I uh, left there and went to the parish of Ascension, where I managed all the infrastructure for Ascension Parish, including their water and, and sewer. So, yeah, Did you have much experience sort of dealing with sort of winter storm events before, uh, before we get to yeah. February? Ironically enough, even in South Louisiana, yes, we had a freezing spell uh, right after I got to um, uh, ascension and so if I ever leave here and go somewhere else they need to be warned that they're gonna have a freezing spell like four months <laughs> after I get there but um, yes so I we did have a freezing incident and we did lose water uh, I think most of the state lost it as well okay so or at least most of South Louisiana lost it um, we got it back pretty quickly uh, but yeah that was my first experience with winter weather okay so, as you were saying, you were on the job here about four or five months when we, uh, you know, get to February of last year. You know, you saw the weather reports coming in for, you know, the potential back-to-back -back winter storms, just the intense cold that really started up uh, that Saturday, that Valentine's Day morning. When did you have an, you know, as an inclination, as someone, you know, with a decent amount of experience doing this, that there potentially could be you know, a problem with uh, water and sewer? Well, we actually, uh, you know, we, we prepared for this event ahead of time. Uh, we had numerous meetings. We had our uh, field operations people ready. We had uh, Miss Maple Lars, you know, stocked up on everything. We filled every tank that we had, you know, to the brim. So we were concerned about the effect of the winter storm. I don't know that we at the time knew really how bad it was going to be, uh, but we were prepared for everything that we could prepare for. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess once the storm went, you know, started, um, and I don't remember, it was probably a day or two into the storm uh, of the freezing cold when, when I, I knew that we were uh, going to be in trouble. And I had this very difficult phone call with the mayor to tell him that we were about to lose our water to, to the hospitals and to the dialysis centers and to the nursing homes. And, and, and that was a very, very difficult call um, to be sure. But immediately, you know, the mayor said, it's good, you know, it's better to know it as quickly as possible so we can start taking the right steps and, and so we started utilizing tanker trucks to, to get to them. But it wasn't long into the storm, to go back to your question, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't long into the storm that we realized that we were gonna have a problem. So I was gonna ask you, when, did, when was that call to the mayor when you're like, our, you know, it's kind of almost like, you know, we've got a, we've got a big, big problem here. Yeah, uh, we, we started seeing, uh, uh, well, what happened is people started turning on all their water and uh, to keep their pipes from freezing. And then we had a number of residences where the pipes froze mm -hmm. and busted. And so water was pouring out onto the ground. And 
when that happens and you start getting air in your lines, you know, you know you're going to have you're going to have issues. And so uh, it wasn't like it probably was 24 to 36 hours into the storm that okay because we knew what the duration of the storm was going to be, and we knew you know the the problem with fix you know fixing the uh, all of our leaks was we couldn't even get to them on the roads because they were iced over. So uh, we knew that there was going to be there was going to be a pretty severe impact uh, on the water system. Gotcha. So my question is, you know, as you know, looking at this from a science perspective, how basically how cold does it have to get, or basically how thick does the ground have to be frozen until you you know you get to the pipes and you start to get those kind of bursting issues along the line because that was something that that I was you know that I was curious about you know how deep of a freeze yeah. do we really have to get to well it's not I mean I would I would say that it's that's really not the science the science is there's so many houses where the, the people's pipes aren't protected and when those pipes started bursting and water starts uh, flowing out onto the ground and people are turning on their faucets and we're using so much water way more water than we can make, okay? And that's, that was really the problem. What happened is, is we basically drained our system. But uh, we lost electricity. Now, every time I say that, I know Swepco gets mad at me because they made sure that the plants, uh, our water plants and our sewer plants all had electricity. But they did rolling blackouts in some of the neighborhoods and yep. uh, when they did that, we have booster stations in some of those neighborhoods, and we lost electricity there. Now, that's not Swepco's fault. That's our fault. We were not prepared. We should have generators on those, and we have generators lined up uh, in the future now so that we can keep those booster stations online, but we did not have generators then. So when we lost power, even though it was for a short duration, those tanks drained, mm -hmm. and that really took away a lot of the flexibility that we had. And it also introduced air into the system. And once you get air into your pipes, um, it becomes very difficult to move the water through because the air creates, uh, what the air does is, and that's why we started having all the pipes bursting, is the air creates higher pressure in the pipes than the water ever does. And so then it starts blowing out the pipes. So we had, it was a combination of air getting into the lines, the cold weather, but we were blowing out water pipes everywhere. So really what you're saying, it really wasn't how cold it necessarily got, it was, it was the air moving through the pipes it that was, created that It was the air moving through the pipe. It's, I mean, people in their house have probably experienced this phenomenon. It's called water hammer. And you know, you turn on your pipes sometimes and you hear your, your yeah. pipes clanking. Well, that's because the air is in the pipes and, um, it, it compresses, uh, the air compresses, and so it will get at a much higher pressure than the, you know, the water, because it will try to, it will try to uh, uh, compress and get smaller, and therefore the pressure goes up. Uh, so, uh, so then, you know, our pipes, they're old. We have a lot of old pipes. We have 80-year-old pipes in the ground. There's two 80-year-old 24-inch pipes leaving this plant. Um, that were part of the bond program, it would have been nice to replace them, but it didn't pass. Oh, so okay. we're, we're working on that now outside of, um, outside of uh, uh, the bond program to try, to try to do something about that. But that's 60% of the water to the city. If we have a big problem there, we're gonna be down a while while we try to you know, work out a solution. To, to that issue. Yeah, and you, say, and you say these pipes are 80 years old. What is that, what are they constructive, constructive, constructed out of? They're, they're uh, iron pipes and they have valves, but the valves are also 80 years old and we can't make them open and close anymore. So, uh, you know, isolating them is really the big problem in, in getting them fixed. But, but that's, you know, we have an aging infrastructure. Now we're doing a lot of, uh, we're doing a big project to the plant that in several uh, phases down the line will in increase our uh, ability to make water at a much higher rate. But going back to that storm, basically our pipes emptied. And what we were doing here, uh, and uh, Miss Maples and the, um, 
and, the, and, and her staff here at the plant were making water as fast as they could make it. I mean, we normally make somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 40 million. We were making 75 to 80 million gallons of water a day. Wow. And, but we were filling up a lot of empty pipe and we were filling up pipe that, you know, that was, that we still had um, burst pipes under people's houses. So as fast as we could stick it in the pipe, it was going out somewhere. Yeah. And of course it follows the path of least resistance. So it was just going through and finding, you know, where it, you know, where it was easiest to go. So if there was a big piece of broken pipe and the pressure was low there, then the water would go there and we would, um, we would spill it out on the ground. So, but we had a lot of, we had a lot of outside help. Uh, we had the Louisiana Rural Water Association. Uh, we had uh, the engineering staff came on board. We had the National Guard. We had um, uh, we had several other people, I'm, and I know they're going to be angry. Though we had the Louisiana Department of Health here, uh, and they were all boots on the ground. You know, after after we could get around, they were out looking under houses and if you know if we had broken pipe under there we were turning the water off uh, we had several uh, we had several private firms that were here that were helping us as well uh, going through we were literally walking the lines to uh, you know of the water and we would go and we you get to a fire hydrant and we would open it up and we would blow the air out of that fire hydrant and when we started getting water we would close it and we would move on to the next one so it was a very slow process. I think before everybody in the city had water pressure it was about 10 days. Yeah. Not everybody lost it, um, but most did. And that's something that we don't want to repeat. Yeah, kind of the way I think of it is it was almost like um, trying to look uh, a fire hydrant, like hopping operation going to each one. Sort of uh, <laughs> the way I was thinking about World War II when they did island hopping with the Japanese, yes. I think it was like Kind of like fire hydrant. We, we felt like we were in a war. I can tell you that okay. uh, it, it, it wasn't probably as, it wasn't anywhere close to as dangerous. But yeah. uh, we definitely felt like we were fighting a war, especially uh, when we were trying to fix the pipes and it was nine degrees and ice was covering the roads and uh, we were digging, you know, fifteen foot holes and I had people down in the ground. Water was spraying up. I mean. <sighs> It was, um, they performed, and, and I don't use this very often, but they performed heroically. I mean, that, that was, I think that my staff performed heroically during that storm. Now, the people that didn't have water might disagree, but there were so many factors outside of our control that, um, you know, caused this to happen and some that were that were within our control as well. I mean, I, I readily admit to that. But we're we're taking steps to fix that. But but sometimes weather just wins. Yeah. Mother Nature just triumphs. Well, and that was the case. Yeah, when you talk about the cold, you know, you know, when you're talking about the coldest morning in you know 91 years. You know, that Tuesday morning was when we truly got the right. peak in terms of the Arctic outbreak. How much you know? How much length of pipe ultimately what had to be replaced to kind of get the water pressure? Oh, back? I don't know how much length the pipe we had. I think we we had over a hundred and twenty five uh, repairs that we made in the first uh, ten days to two weeks of the storm. So we we repaired one hundred and twenty five leaks, mm -hmm. uh, most of them fairly major. Um, you know the the biggest problem was finding the leaks. You know first they were covered with ice. And we knew we didn't have water somewhere, but we didn't know why. And then after all the ice started melting and the water's running out on the ground, it's hard to tell, is this ice melting yeah. or is this uh, pipe leaking? So um, there are a number, there are a number, uh, you know, those were problems. Uh, I'll tell you another problem was if you lived on a hill, uh, you got water last because we were trying to push it up the hill, you know? So, uh, that's how much pipe we were filling up. I mean, mm -hmm. we literally filled our entire system up. Wow. So, uh, and, you know, we've had a lot of small leaks over the, the years since the storm. 
And I think a lot of that was, you know, we emptied the pipe. It was the first time all that pipe had probably been emptied in a hundred years. Wow. So then you, you emptied it and then you filled it back up again, you know, at 70 pounds of pressure. So, you know, things just, they, it wasn't made to, 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 um, to uh, uh, respond to that kind of change. And, and, and it being as old as it is, we developed a you know, small lump, number of leaks that we've been fixing all year long. Yeah, so you know, after that you get everything fixed. So what are the certain things? We never have everything fixed. Well, okay. <laughs> as much as you can fix, I'll put, put it that way. What You said you guys have made changes going forward. I'm curious uh, what sort of changes you made to think to handle the next you know, winter apocalypse that potentially could come okay. to the Arklatex? So, you know, one of the most, Im one of the most important things uh, when dealing in with a situation like this is having the information that you need to uh, find solutions. And we were in, in the first uh, snowmageddon winter apocalypse, <laughs> uh, winter storm event, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. We didn't have we didn't have information. You know, we didn't know where we had pressure and where we didn't. Uh, we we were doing a lot of manually going out and putting meters on fire hydrants and seeing is there a pressure here. And we have bought some remote pressure sensing equipment so that we can now, you know, in, in preparation for a storm event, we'll be able to go out there and we'll be able to monitor different places uh, in the city, so that that that'll give us an idea. Uh, we couldn't, we should have all been in one room fighting this weather storm, but you know, I was, I was in one place, my field staff was in another place, my deputy director was in another place, Kiana was in another place, uh, our um, phone system was uh, not functioning properly because we had, not only did we have lines down, but we didn't have enough people that could come into work to answer the phones. Uh, so we, so we, we have looked at all that and we now are issuing computers to our phone staff so that they can take them home and they'll be able to answer uh, phone calls at home as long as they have power. Uh, we're, up, we're, we're actually gonna upgrade our uh, phone system uh, over the next um, year or so so that we'll even be more prepared to do that the remote pressure sensing that we're going to have. We're looking to have AMI meters, which are automatic uh, meters, so we'll be able, we'll know whether or not we have water at, at almost every home in, in the city. Wow. We're working on that. That's, that's also coming in the next 12 months. Uh, we are looking, we're putting remote pressure system and tying it into a SCADA system. Uh, we are buying, uh, or we have buying, we have bought the old uh, Schlumberger slash BJ Services building out on West 70th. There will be a war room there prior to any uh, big weather event. We will assemble all of our staff there and we'll be there for the duration. I mean, we'll sleep there, we'll eat there, we'll fight the storm there where we can all be in one room and um, be able to have the, have the knowledge and the information have the, have the people with the knowledge and the information there to see what's going on in the city while we are, um, you know, trying to figure things out. Uh, we were putting, we were printing out 11 by seven maps of the water system up and, and, and tacking them to a wall at our field operations. That was the way we were working before. Mm -hmm. That is not the way you want to uh, approach a problem of this magnitude. We need real-time information and you know we were we had people out um, taking a measurement and then they were calling it in on the phone and then we were writing it on a wow. piece of paper. So, so very old school. Very old yeah. school and we are upgrading that. So it's not the way you want to learn a lesson but we've definitely learned lessons uh, that we are applying in the future. Now some of them we've put into place already, but some of them we're going to take some time to get everything straight and, you know, money as well. So, yeah. and then I, you know, on the flip side of that, I also have to be cognizant of our federal sewer consent decree and I have to be fixing sewer pipe. And in fact, I've probably spent close to $500 million on water and sewer 
uh, and since 2016, uh, and 95% of that's been on sewer. So we've really not been able to, to spend the money on the water system like we were supposed to because of the federal consent decree. Gotcha. And one thing you were saying, obviously, is for the bond proposal that didn't pass, but it was to replace, you said, two of the main? Two 24-inch line? lines that leave the plant that provide 60% of the water to the city. Gotcha. I mean, when you drive out, you're going to drive right, right by them. Okay. There's two 24-inch lines. They were put in between 80 and 90 years ago. Wow. And uh, one of them's already got a leak. So... Uh, and we're, you know, we're managing it and we're going to continue to manage it. But should there be, and I'm not trying to scare people because we don't s suspect there's going to be a, a catastrophic failure. Yeah. But it, there's always the potential for that. And uh, we are trying to make contingency plans in the event that that does. We were hoping to replace them. Yeah. But um, it's about a $3 million price tag. So we're, 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 we're saving up for that yeah. and then we're going to, uh, but we're making contingency plans in the interim. I guess my question would be, because you said they're made out of iron, is there a certain type of metal or alloy that's better to sort of deal with the pressure situation that you talked about from last year? Well, we would, you know, we, we have, those those pipes were uh, are old. There's newer uh, versions of, 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 of pipe that we would use. Uh, I'm not sure what the engineers would would recommend for that. It would probably be some sort of plastic oh, okay. pipe uh, that we would put in the ground. What we the, the idea behind that was actually to put two new 24 inch lines in, take the other two 24 inch lines out of service, then replace them with two new 24 inch lines. So then we would have and then revalve it all. Then we would have. Uh, for 60% of our water going through the plant, we would have a backup plan automatically. Okay. And that's what, you know, that's what we're actually trying to accomplish. We, we, we want to have a plan and then a plan B and then even a plan C behind that. So um, that's, that's what, what we're working to. That's what the mayor tasked me to do. He's very uh, insistent that we take all pro possible precautions uh, to protect um, the citizens, especially the most vulnerable citizens of yeah. Shreveport. So uh, that's that's my job uh, right now is to do that. Okay. Um, that's what I only have two questions. One is relating to ice. Is just because of the nature of ice. And you know, because it's going to be cold temperatures, it's slick and stuff. Is is that possibly the worst kind of weather event you can have? That uh, you know, when you're dealing with uh, an infrastructure issue. Yeah, the 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 ice was uh, one of our biggest problems because it prevented us from getting our vehicles out on the street to um, to fix things. It prevented us from finding where we had issues. Uh, and then it also just meant it was it was pretty darn cold. Yeah. And uh, so the yeah the ice the ice was a big problem, but you know essentially um, we need you know we needed to we need to do things to be better prepared. We need to have generators at our booster stations. We need to educate the public on you don't have to run your water full blast because all you're going to do is get a big water bill. Uh, yeah, just drip. Just drip mm -hmm. it. And you know we're gonna we're we're actually redesigning our website so that uh, we're gonna have some videos on what what dripping should look like, <laughs> <laughs> so that so that you know people will understand. And we're gonna try to do some uh, mail outs in the water bills that's gonna explain to you know how to how to better prepare for winter weather. But um, so there's a lot of things that we can do to I think to be better prepared. Uh, again, you know, our infrastructure was not made for the type of weather that happened back uh, last February. And you mean like the, the prolonged period of yes, the sub-freezing? The, the, yes, yeah. the, the total sub-freezing. I mean, to build infrastructure like that would be the equivalent of, of designing your highways for rush hour traffic. Yeah. I mean, because most, you know, 90% of the time you would have all this excess space. Yeah. For you know, like for an hour every day, 
yeah, things would still fl flow smoothly, but think of the cost of that. Yeah. So it, it's, it's sort of, you know, you, you really can't build anything like that uh, in this part of the country because it's, it's just, you're, you're not spending your money wisely. Right. So, so what you have to do is you have to be prepared that if you ever get something like that, well, what are you gonna do? And um, we were, I think, as prepared as we knew how to be. I think we know better now how to be a little more prepared, but we were as prepared as we knew how to be when that storm hit uh, in February. It just, we did not know everything. I mean, mm -hmm. We have a book this thick of emergency procedures. Wow. And we were on top of every single one of them, but we did not have an emergency procedure for what happens if there's six inches of ice on the ground and it stays there for three or four days. Yeah. So, um, that's in the book now. Uh, no, <laughs> it's actually not, but because uh, I hope it never happens again. But we will be much better prepared in the future. Do you, just on a lighter note, do you just hate snow and ice now just on a semi-permanent oh, basis? I've hated snow and ice since uh, I was young. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a warm weather guy. Oh, okay. I, I do not like, I mean, you know, I, I used to enjoy skiing and I just said, no, nah, it's too cold. I'm not going to ski anymore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to do warm weather sports. <laughs> and I think this is just a, a kind of wrapped up in, in not assume anything, but ask if it's fair to say then. This was unprecedented, and it was sort of like the perfect cocktail with five ingredients to cause this. We didn't know what we didn't know in terms of, you know, information in the city and people in their homes, how to deal with it. We had infrastructure that wasn't prepared for this, be it because it was old and just because of the cost of the South. Unprecedented weather um, that this just, these, and, and we didn't have some systems in place. We might, we might now have like the, the pressure gauges in the, in the, right. in the pump uh, the, generators. The, I would say, you know, if I were to point, if you said what was the biggest problem, I would say the length of the time that we were below freezing. That, I mean, because, you know, it's going to be below freezing three or four days in a row here coming up. Yep. But it goes up to 40 in the afternoon. Yeah, so it's not and as big so a problem. And so it's not, but I mean, we, we were at, you know, nine and went to 19 for several yeah. days in a row. So weather like that, we're just not prepared for. And um, it creates problems that, of a magnitude that we had never experienced before. And uh, now we're gonna be better prepared in the future, I promise you that, but we were not, we, we were not, the, the 